mode. Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's webinar featuring BEND Research, Solubilization by Extrusion, Formulation Selection and Process Development. My name is Donna Papacosta and I'll be your host for today. This seminar will run for about 50 minutes, including a Q&A session toward the end. The webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to type in questions and comments throughout the presentation by using the questions function located on the panel on the right side of your screen. If we cannot answer your question during the allotted time period, we will send you a direct reply after the live webinar. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. This event will be recorded and made available for future download from bendresearch.com and from excellience.com. The presentation slides will advance automatically. If you need technical assistance, please contact GoToWebinar at the numbers displayed. In the U.S., that's 800-263-6317 or 1-805-617-7000. Now we'd like to begin the formal presentation. For more than 35 years, Bend Research has worked with clients to create value by advancing new medicines that improve human health and to solve their most difficult scientific and technical problems. This success is based on the company's ability to develop, advance, and commercialize pharmaceutical technologies, which grow from a solid base of scientific and engineering fundamental understanding. Bend Research provides formulation and dosage form support, assists in process development and optimization, manufactures clinical trial quantities of drug candidates at its current good manufacturing practice facilities, advancing promising drug candidates from conception through commercialization. The company is a leader in novel formulations, including solubilization technologies such as SDDs and hot melt extrusion formulations, as well as controlled release, inhalation, and biotherapeutics formulations. I'd now like to welcome our speaker for today's seminar, Trevor Weigel, PE. Mr. Weigel, Vice President, is responsible for all aspects of engineering and facilities, including strategic leadership and planning, financial management, and engineering excellence. He has led multidisciplinary teams to design, build, and maintain equipment and facilities used to make pharmaceutical products particularly those based on extrusion platforms. His expertise includes managing technically complex multinational engineering products, including technology and product development and commercialization. Mr. Weigel holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Santa Clara University and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. He is a licensed professional engineer in Oregon and has two publications. He has worked at Bend Research since 2003. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Trevor Weigel. Trevor, you may begin when ready. Thank you, Donna. Um, uh, quite an introduction. It's uh, interesting to hear your own introduction. That's for, different than, uh, than um, the way when it's written on paper, that's for sure. Um, I'd also like to thank Excellence for putting on the webinar, especially all the hard work that Kim Black Washington um, put into this and also Phoenix Ivers on this. Today, um, what we're going to be talking about is solubilization by extrusion. So I'll basically step through what it is that we do here at Bend Research around the formulation feasibility, initial process development, as well as the uh, process optimization and scale-up type activities. So without further ado, we'll go to the the slides. Donna did an excellent job of describing some of uh, what Bend Research is, but in my own words, what I'll basically say about Bend Research is that we are a company that for the last 37 years has had a couple of things that have made, maintained very constant. One is that we're a problem-solving company, and we're focused on using fundamental science and engineering to solve those problems. Um, in addition to not just using fundamental science and engineering, we also have a holistic view where our goal is to start from the very beginning and have it take it all the way to commercialization so we can realize the true value. Right now we are focused significantly in the drug delivery space and our um, capitalization, our facilities, our lab, and our people are very organized vertically to be able to do that. 
can see some pictures of some of our facilities on the right, but we basically have the ability to go from all the way from early research analytical through the engineering um, development, scale up, and process optimization through to GMP manufacturing. So why are we interested in hot melt extrusion as a technology and why are we talking about it? The primary driver is that the industry as a whole is shifting from where previously molecules had very good solubility in a lot of crystalline morphologies. Um, it's moving more towards BCS class II type compounds where solubility is a concern. And once solubility becomes a concern, you have to find a solution for that, usually with some sort of technology, drug delivery technology. There's a list on the right there of several different drug delivery technologies, whether it's amorphous systems, nanocrystal lipids, and there's many others than that also. Within the amorphous space, there's also um, many subsets to that where you can break down either through spray drying technologies, hot melt extrusion, or nanoparticles, and other ones there too. Today we're going to talk specifically about the hot melt extrusion amorphous systems and, and the work that's going into that area. There is commercial precedence for hot melt extrusion. Of, you know, some of the best known ones are ones like Calitra um, uh, from, from Abbott, but there, there are more than that also. So with a little bit of background for before we jump right into the technical details of how we do process formulation and process development and bend research. I wanted to do a little background on how we break down problems at Bend Research so some of the lingo that I'm going to use during the presentation makes some sense. Basically, when it comes to pharmaceutical drug delivery, when we break our problem down and really look at it fundamentally from a science and engineering point of view, we try and balance performance manufacturing stability across any of the individual areas that we're looking at. And the way, that we, the way that we do that in a systematic manner is that we look at the functionality of whatever it is that we're working on with respect to our goal. So in the area of hot melt extrusion, it would be looking at how the incoming raw materials, the equipment configuration like the screw design and die design, feed rates, and the process, con process conditions like feed rates, screw speed, and barrel temperatures lead to an output that is what we want for a product characteristic. And that could be the amorphous homogeneity, um, the purity of the materials, the dissolution rate, the stability, um, and another one might be a manufacturing thing like throughput. So basically, the way that we break the problem down is not to try and look at the functionality holistically as, it, as an, entire, um, uh, an entire process and system. We try and break it down into the smallest control volume that is relevant. And then we try to, once we have the, the system broken down into the fundamental control volumes, we use models and experiments to quantify. And that's really where we're getting at the functionality, is the small scale experiments and the models to quantify the functionality of how all the formulation, equipment configuration, and process parameters lead to the product characteristics that we're looking for. Once we have that functionality defined, then the next step is that we need to take that and use it in a smart fashion. And so one of the things that we like to do here is organize them into flow charts. And we, we like to call these our best practices of how we reduce to practice that fundamental understanding that we have into an efficient manner for developing a formulation or process. Once you have that functionality defined and built, you can use it in a lot of different ways. And, and whether it's um, troubleshooting um, at, a, at an individual scale or whether you're looking to scale a process up. It could be used for optimization at um, extremely large scale and it can also be used for things like defining the um, quality by design space for an, a regulatory filing. So today, in addition to um, talking about extrusion, I'm going to narrow the, the scope a little bit further to just talking about the extruder. Obviously, extrusion is a, uh, a process that involves um, uh, some upstream raw excipients. The diagram I have here shows blending the raw excipients and then feeding with a single gravimetric feeder into an extruder, onto a calendaring equipment, and then finally to a mill. And each of these individual components, um, there's different options and configurations that you can do. And we could give an entire talk on gravimetric feeding or pelletizing and cooling. Um, but for today, we're just going to focus on the extrusion portion of it. 
The good thing about extrusion, and one of the other reasons why we're talking about it today, is that it's a very efficient, highly uh, reproducible, continuous process. So all the, all the benefits of a continuous process are really manifested in the extruder. It's easily controlled, it's very reproducible, and you truly can run it in a fully continuous operation. It also takes up a small footprint in the manufacturing facility, so without, without the need for solvents and other things, which make it a very attractive, uh, attractive option for um, late, later stage and downstream uh, commercial processing. Before we dive into the, this is the last slide that's before we dive into the details, or I guess there's two more slides until we dive into the details of exactly what we do at Bend Research, but um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I like to talk about the physical situation of extrusion a little bit. So basically the extruder is a, uh, a long, narrow pump and mixing system. With respect to the mixing, it does two different types of mixing. It does distributive and dispersive mixing. The easiest way to think about that is dispersive is more of the, um, uh, the fixed law diffusion type mixing and dispersive mixing is the bulk domain mixing. And depending on the screw configuration and the element choices, you can bias the, a, a, a certain process section more or less towards dispersive or distributive mixing. And that's, uh, that's the, the primary thing that you're looking for in your design is how do I get a complete homogeneous mixture without putting too much energy into the system and driving it towards the degradant product that you like, that, that you don't want to have in the system. I have some terminology listed there on the right-hand side. The, there's a few of those that are very critical um, when it comes to understanding what's physically going on within the, uh, the system itself. The degree of fill is one that I always like to point out because really what it comes down to is that any, any elements any screw element, how much energy is being put into that packet of material at any point in time is completely dependent upon the degree of fill and the rheology of the material at that point. Basically, with a lower degree of fill, the energy per unit volume is much, much higher. So we'll go on to talking briefly about elements. With respect to elements, um, there's really no such thing as an element that does only one or the other, whether that be dispersive or distributive mixing. But the two primary um, modes that you try and look at that are, with respect to dispersive mixing, is you'll use something like a kneading block. And a kneading block is really, um, as is shown in the picture, is a, um, long, a long block that's very straight that tries to have very little forward conveying power in it. You can actually have reversing um, elements that actually try and back it up and put a lot more energy into the system. But generally speaking, a uh, kneading block is primarily driven around dispersive mixing. So how do, you, how do you reduce the length scale over which the diffusion of the API into the polymer is supposed to be happening? And that's, that's the main goal of the dispersive element. A combing element, on the other hand, the main goal of that is around dividing and dividing up in the bulk mixing of the of the material itself, and so it does have a, some forward can have some forward conveying um, uh, power to it at least a little bit, or backwards depending on how you have it configured. Uh, but the main goal in the, in the combing element is to actually drive the the bulk mixing so that by the time it gets to a um, kneading block element in the individual packet of material is relatively homogeneous so that when you stretch it and elongate it and get the length scale very small in a kneading block element, you've got, a, you've got all the parts that you need there to make a homogeneous mixture. So this slide is basically, this is our process development flowchart. This captures everything that we do holistically during our initial feasibility all the way through to scale up in, in one single slide. I'll use this to drive the presentation and bounce back to this every once in a while to sort of show where we are in the process and, and talk about what the next steps are. The first thing that we're going to talk about is going to be the initial formulation feasibility. The way that we look at amorphous formulation feasibility is actually independent of the, the path that it's being, that it goes 
downstream. So if it's going to be a spray drying process or a hot melt extrusion process, we basically do the same initial feasibility work to determine whether or not an amorphous um, formulation is, is relevant. There's a couple of caveats that we add in there, like we might choose some different polymers that we wouldn't if, the, if, the, if we know that the desire is to move it towards a hot melt extrusion process. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we treat the amorphous dispersion as an independent decision that needs to be made whether it's um, a hot melt extrusion process or not. With respect to the initial feasibility work that goes on, the way that we do that is that we use the understanding of the physiochemical properties of the API and we, with that we make some educated choices around polymer selection. And with the, the right array of polymers, then you look at the, this plot here on the left basically drives what sort of loading you would expect to see and why you would want to drive the polymer loading in a certain direction. So the short story there is that if it's got a higher propensity for crystallization, which would be um, reducing its physical stability on the left-hand axis, or whether it's going to be um, a very greasy compound and a dissolution rate limited molecule would be further out to the right. And this is, so basically with the physiochemical properties, we make some polymer selections and we choose some active loadings um, using this chart here. And then what we do is we do small scale spray drying to create amorphous dispersions with just a few milligrams of material. We take those, those selected few um, that we believe will have a good chance of giving us the performance we want and we do in vitro characterization of those. Everything from dissolution to um, DSC and PXRD. So we're basically looking at both its dissolution performance as well as accelerated stability performance. Again, trying to, the goal being to make sure that we're balancing our performance, manufacturability, and stability. Once we have um, uh, initial formulations selected out of there that look like they're going to give us the appropriate dissolution rate as well as the physical stability we're looking for, we then move on to predicting the bioavailability. We have some um, in silico bio models that we use to predict the species and the, how those species will perform in vivo. So once, once we have that process done, we now have um, some initial formulation selections. When it comes to hot melt extrusion, there's additional work to do uh, because there, there's additional constraints that are put on the operating space with respect to hot melt extrusion. So we'll go and investigate that as the next step. So one of the things that you have to look at with respect to hot melt extrusion is the, the stability and the ability for the polymer and API to mix and get into uh, a complete liquid amorphous dispersion. And so at process conditions, you have to force, what we have here is a picture of a phase diagram of our polymer and our API. And basically at the process condition, you have to be outside um, of the phase diagram for sure. And typically for hot melt extrusion processes, we would like to see it be an actually thermodynamically stable um, uh, solid solution so that even at room temperature, the API is still fully soluble in the polymer. Even though the extruder doesn't have extremely fast quench rates, it is possible to move somewhat past the binodal curve um, uh, for certain situations and still maintain performance. But that is, again, going to be quench rate determined as well as determined by the mobility of the API and the polymer matrix. So basically what we do is we would need to develop what this, what the binodal curve line looks like for an individual formulation, which we can do at very, very small scale using DSC. And the goal of the work that we would be doing around trying to define where our, what these boundaries are for the extruder is to come up with an operating space. And I'll, I'll refer back to this operating space map um, several times throughout this document, but you'll notice that, so the two axes on the, on the operating space model are the operating temperature and the residence time. And this operating space is basically limited by several different things. One thing being the equipment operating limits. 
So there's a there's a minimum residence time, and that's limited by the volumetric pumping capacity. And there's a maximum residence time, which is basically limited by the ability for the extruder to seal and pump. Then you also have a minimum temperature limit, and that's driven typically by the melting or glass transition temperature of either the API, the polymer, or the dispersion, the combined dispersion. And the upper temperature limit is usually defined by degradants of either the API or the polymer or both. And the line that's the most difficult to obtain is the complete dispersion line. And I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about what that line is and how we go about actually finding it. So the residence time is a key parameter in the extruder, as you can tell. So we, um, up to now, throughout this entire process, we have not used an extruder at all. And we have um, basically have a few shots on goal for what we want our active and polymers to active loading and polymer selection to be. And so now when we move to extruder, this first shot with an extruder is actually again with only placebo. So no active will go into the extruder at this point. And what we'll do is we'll map out what the residence time distribution is for different configurations of the extruder. Now I'm, I'm showing the output here for a specific for you know a specific polymer, a specific con con screw configuration without any manufacturing aids, um, whether they be surfactants or uh, PPGS or any of those types of things. And so this is this is a very simplistic um, version of what what you might have to do to really understand the resonance time distributions for um, the, the actual formulations you have of interest. But basically, though, we still try, without using any active, to get a good understanding of what the process conditions. We know from the process map before where sort of where the bounds are in residence time for heat degradation and those sorts of things. And now what we need to do is translate that into actual process conditions and configurations onto the extruder. And that's what we do with these residence time studies, so that we get an understanding for how feed rate, screw configuration, and screw speed and barrel temperature all feed into deriving that um, temperature history that will give us the residence time distribution and, and uh, temperature history that we're looking for. So next I have a, a brief example of the type of uh, actually developing the initial map and, and how we would go about using that. So this is an example that we did of using um, commercially available phenofibrate uh, where basically what we did is we did a couple of experiments, many experiments, where we did um, in, in DSC pans, we did the phase diagram first so that we could find out where the binodal spectrum is. And in this case, it turned out that somewhere around 20 to 25 percent is sort of the limit that you would expect to be able to see in an extrudate uh, and still maintain thermodynamic stability. And we also did the TG versus um, active concentration so that we could then predict what our minimum operating temperatures would be. So on the next slide, this is basically the output of that work. And this would be the initial, the initial processing space map that we would come up with. So we have two active loadings here, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and you'll notice that the Polymer degradation temperature, what we did there was we used the conservative approach was make it a flat line <clears throat> at the temperature at which you see degradation over a time period that is relevant for the extruder. And the minimum on the, on the left-hand side, the minimum temperature for processing is driven actually by the TG of the dispersion. And on the right-hand side, it's driven by the, um, the TG of the polymer. So now we have a high and a low bounds, and we have a high, a high and a low bounds on temperature and a high and a low bounds on mean residence time. So the one piece that's obviously missing from that is the complete dispersion line. So the complete dispersion line is the piece that we currently need to find experimentally. And so now we've got a rough operating space. And now what we need to do is find out exactly where that complete dispersion line is. The thing that drives the complete dispersion line is a function of the kinetic solubility of the API in the polymer 
as well as the physical situation of the mixing in the actual extruder. So that is completely dependent upon your operating conditions, whether it's throughput, screw speed, um, meeting block design, temperatures, those types of things. So our goal ultimately is to end up with this complete operating map and, and we'll show you how we step through figuring out the, the complete dispersion line. So now that now, now at this point we've used just a few milligrams of material, we've got two formulations that we're wanting to try on the extruder and we take that and we actually do some initial production runs on the extruder. So with respect to what we do with respect to the initial configuration is that we basically walk in with a map where we don't know that complete dispersion line. And so our goal is, is to make that operating space as wide as possible. To enable that, we actually start with a relatively aggressive screw configuration. And that does, there's a couple of reasons why you would want to do that. One is to have a generally wide operating space. And when I say relatively aggressive, um, I'm meaning quite a bit of kneading block, quite a bit of pressure, but not going all the way to, say, reversing elements and those types of things that really um, significantly increase the pressure. But we definitely don't start on the easy side and then work up. We try and start relatively aggressive. Um, that, way, that way we're putting enough energy in to get an amorphous dispersion. The second reason that you want to start with an aggressive screw configuration is that if you are using your elements to actually create the melt rather than relying on barrel and wall temperature, you end up with a much more scalable design. And the reason for that is that the shear rate and the, the shear history within the extruder is something that is scalable, whereas the surface area to volume is not. And so if you're relying significantly on barrel heating to create the melt, um, it, ends up, it ends up being something that you have to deal with as you scale. So once we have our initial screw configuration and our initial formulations and our processing space, we pick some processing conditions and start to probe where that line of complete dispersion is. And our goal is just to find a robust space that's in the operating space um, where we have a lot of room to move around and find a molecular dispersion. That's where, that's where the initial, um, that's where extrusion is actually a really great process because of the fact that it's continuous. You can rapidly test out several different configurations um, with, without having to do complete startups and shutdowns as independent runs. And so we'll, we'll test out, we'll do a, a set of experiments around the operating space to try and understand where that complete dispersion line is. And then we'll do the analytical characterization afterwards. If during that time we were unable to achieve the, the molecular dispersion that we're looking for, we do a feedback loop. And so this is where we would go back and do some calculations as to um, you know, what, what are the major things we need to change to the configuration to, to get at the complete dispersion. Initially, we'll do the easy low-hanging fruit ones like decreasing the feed rate and or screw speed and or, and or increasing the screw speed. Um, and we'll increase the barrel temperature, and, uh, and if, those, if those areas don't help us, then the next step would actually be to go back and change the actual screw design itself. And if that didn't work, then you continue down the track. But typically, typically we're able to, um, uh, just because of experience, we're able to actually hit it on the first shot, but, um, but there is a lot of knots to turn to actually get to a, a complete process. So once you, have, um, uh, once you have a defined operating space, you're ready to move into process scale up. So process scale up is basically the last box in this. Um, I guess one thing I didn't say on the initial production runs, usually at the end of the initial production runs, we also do what we call um, uh, in-house, we call it an FPN or a formulation and process nomination. So we'll have a formulation of process that's ready to go into clinical production at that, at that stage. And that's usually when you would make supplies for talks or for stability or for 
um, initial phase one uh, BE studies and those or uh, bioavailability studies, those types of things. Once you have some success there, the next step would be to move into process scale up. So for process scale up, there's um, some very nice things about screw machinery that make this um, a, a very nice process. And so the, the main thing, if you do, if you look at the power that you put into the system and the ability of the system to generate pressure, similarity theory works very well. And so if you keep your screw speed the same, you can basically maintain your power and pressure number across scales. And this is, this is true for anything sort of from the 18 millimeter up to the 27, and we've done this up to a 50 millimeter scale. So then when you look at it, basically the, the short story is the throughput number is what changes, which is good since the goal is to produce more material through scale up. And so you need to scale your throughput proportional to the diameter of the barrel to the cube and maintain screw speed in similarity theory gives you a very good starting place for your scale up. And again, this is the starting place for the scale up. There, um, as always, will be optimization work that needs to happen to map out the true space at the larger scale. Here's a couple of scale comparisons. Um, the, the short story here is that the um, all of the extruder design companies, such as Lystrits in this example, have done a very nice job of making units that are scalable. And so scaling from the micro 18 to the, the 27 is, is um, the similarity theory does hold true. The one thing that you would have to be concerned with is the maximum shear, as we show in the top. So if for some reason there was a high shear sensitivity of, a, of, um, of one of the excipients or the API, then uh, you'd be concerned with uh, you'd be concerned with the maximum shear rate, and you might think about changing your process conditions as you scale up to maintain maximum shear, but still maintain within the operating space. But the things that really um, typically matter are the average shear and the degree of fill, and those those are very scalable um, and very tra transferable between the two different uh, two different units. So really the next steps for Bend Research on this are to get a better quantified understanding at a small scale how to define the complete dispersion mine. And so a couple of the ways that we're looking at that are both through using either a model or, a, um, uh, or an experimental system at a very small scale to define and a, and a good understanding for how that small scale translates to the larger scale in a way that allows us to predict the, the larger scale um, operation. So I've got a picture down at the bottom of some smaller scale equipment and really the, the gap um, to be able to use that equipment to be 100% predictive is to have a complete understanding for how to translate. The similarity theory does not hold true for the, the smallest scale to, say, the 18 millimeter scale. And so there needs to be a better understanding of the, um, uh, of the physical situation that will allow us to do small scale experiments and predict where that um, homogeneous transition line would occur. And so once, you, once, you, once you're able to do that at the small scale and then predict the 18 millimeter scale, then the next, the next goal is to make sure that as you scale up, you have better predictive understanding of what does change at the larger scale. Um, similarity theory works great, um, but it can always be improved. So that's pretty much it as far as the presentation goes. Um, Donna, I know, is going to take over from now, and so we can address some questions as we go through as over any of the slides that you saw. Yes, thanks very much, Trevor. Uh, we, yes, we're now moving into the Q&A part of our program, and at this point I'd like to invite our audience to continue sending questions or comments by using the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. But we'll start with a question that we have, and that is, 
what is the smallest commercially available extruder that is scalable? Yeah, so um, in, in our opinion, from our experience, the, um, the 18 millimeter is about as small as it gets that we've had experience with that is scalable. We do have smaller scale extruders than that and have quite a bit of experience with them. Um, but as far as being able to use similarity theory as you're, as you're scaling um, your process for scaling the, the equipment, the 18 millimeter is about as small as, um, as is relevant. Okay, and here's another question for you, Trevor. Can you use CFD to model the extruder? Um, it has been done, uh, and really if you think about the, the physical situation within the extruder and the way that CFD works, there's a complicated um, volume of fill interface, air um, interface, as well as the complicated rheology of moving from a powder to a liquid um, or a melt is, uh, is it, it's not, in our experience, it has not been very predictive as of yet. Um, that doesn't mean that in the future it won't be, but right now it has not been able to predict the, the rheology or the, um, the uh, degree of fill to an adequate form that will allow it to be predictive of shear rate and temperature histories of the packet as it moves through the extruder. Okay, and another question. What CTM manufacturing capabilities does Bend Research have? Um, so with respect specifically to extrusion, we can do um, any sort of extrude, whether it be from a 18 up through a 27 millimeter extruder in our GMP facility, as well as all of the ancillary um, equipment that it takes to take that extrude, mill it, turn it into a tablet, coat it, and um, small scale packaging. Outside of hot melt extrusion, we also do a lot of other drug product intermediates like spray drying, fluid bed processing, um, melt spray congealed, those types of things. Okay. And another question is, what is the quench rate from an extruder? So the, the quench rate from an extruder is typically on the order of minutes. Um, uh, you know, it, it, to be sub minute is pretty fast on an extruder. It can be um, several minutes, and it depends on basically your downstream configuration and what systems you have for removing heat. Okay. Uh, another one, what bulk sparing methods can you use to determine a scalable extrusion process? So um, initially, as I mentioned, uh, during the initial feasibility stage, we like to use DSC and TGA <clears throat> to really do our formulation selection to make sure that we're in a robust formulation space. And that can be really critical during the, the scale of a, uh, during the scaling of a process to make sure that you're in a thermodynamic space that is where you want to be and at least have an understanding of where you are on that thermodynamic map. And you can do all of that work in a bulk sparing manner um, using small scale spray drying, um, DSC, TGA, those types of things to really map out where the phase diagram is to, to have a good understanding so that when you scale, even if it isn't in a thermodynamically um, stable space, you at least have the understanding that it's not in what the critical parameters are that you should be watching as you do scale. And as I said, this is also an area um, uh, of, of future expansion for us, both on the modeling as well as the experimental side, to really get a better understanding for how to translate what you do at the smallest mini compounder scale all the way up to, and how, how, how to operate that in a way that is representative of the type of physical situation you can achieve at the larger scale. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Trevor. Uh, we have no more questions coming in. I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And don't worry if you missed part of the presentation. Simply visit www.excellience.com where you can download any of our archived scientific seminars or visit www.bendresearch.com directly. 
If you want to share this presentation with your colleagues, simply note their name and email address in the post-webinar survey. We will then send them a link to the archived presentation. Please join me in thanking our speaker for today, Trevor Weigel, who is the Vice President at Bend Research. You will notice that a post-event survey will pop up on your screen at the end of today's seminar. Please do fill out this survey because we would really appreciate your feedback as well as your suggestions for future webinar topics. Thank you all for your time. We hope you found this webinar informative. Have a great day.